My name is Rose and I'm an archaeologist and a heritage consultant. I'm also a mother and a daughter and a wife. I've always known I was going to conceive. My parents shared this knowledge with me openly and like children do, I accepted it. I was conceived at Dr June Backwell's private clinic in East Melbourne through a program run by Professor John Leighton. Today I'm going to talk to you about my own search for my heritage but also present a summary of other cases I've worked on, the lessons I've learned and the future direction for DNA linking for don't conceived adults. When I started searching four years ago, I contacted Varta, Monash IVF and Professor Leighton himself and I soon found out that there were no records relating to my conception at all. Imagine that for a moment, no records at all. The doctors have records relating to adoptions that occurred many years before I was born in 1976. My mother had eight months of treatment but before I was born, but there are no records of this. And this is not a unique case at all. Fast forward to five years ago, age 38, and I wrote a letter to my unknown donor that I didn't imagine I would ever get to send. Part of it went like this. I'm curious, I would like to know if I get my freckles from you, or my hands, or my hair colour. Does my interest in continued learning and science come from you? Does my interest in family history and research come from you? Do my kids have elements of you in their looks or personalities? At this stage, I would just like to know more about you. What do you look like? What did you look like as a child? What is your family history? Do you have other children? What things interest and inspire you? The advent of direct-to-consumer DNA tests at this particular time in all the history of the world has given me and thousands of other DNA, uh, thousands of other donor conceived and adopted people back some power. I still <coughs> cannot honestly believe this has happened. So five years ago, I tested with all of the major direct-to-consumer DNA tests at the time, Ancestry, Family Tree DNA, and 23andMe. I found some distant cousins, fourth cousins, so we shared great-great-great-grandparents. But there was no instant, this is your father moment. I started researching, Googling, reading and networking in the genetic genealogy community. I found clusters of DNA cousins that were related to me and to each other. Logic and science says that these groups, including me, should have a shared ancestor. So all I needed to do was find the shared ancestors for each group, build descendant trees for them, wait till the trees intersect each other, and that's where my donor would be. So I did that. Um, it was not simple and it was not straightforward. I spent three hours a night for six months. I should have been hanging out with my husband. Sorry, I followed can you just speak up? Yeah, sure. Okay. okay, no problem. Is that better? Yeah. This is a very short week now. <laughs> um, I, I followed at least three very false leads, getting distracted by information from the treating doctor that most donors were medical students. Well, when it all came together and I found my donor, guess what? He was a historian and a heritage professional like me. <laughs> I knew beyond a doubt that this was my guy. He had my eyebrows, my hands, my hair colour, my chin and my freckles, and my passions. For me, the moment of revelation was incredible. I was immensely proud of myself and totally blown away by the possibilities. I realised that he was already 84. So I wrote and sent a letter that night. He got it three days later and called me. We talked for three hours. He was totally surprised and chuffed to talk to me. We corresponded by phone and letter, but we never got to meet. He shared family and medical histories with me and told me I looked more like his mother than anyone in his family. And he died nine months later. I've since used my learning from this case to help 20 other donor-conceived adults find their donors, and I've helped 15 adoptees find parents. I do this in my non-existent spare time because I feel so passionately that we all deserve to know where we come from. It's difficult for those who haven't experienced what this feels like to understand how incredible it is to find those connections, however short or bittersweet they are. Each case is unique. The quickest I found someone's donor using only DNA results is six hours. <laughs> the longest cases I've worked on for over a year. This is not rocket science. There are thousands of people doing this with and for each other all over the world. It's really incredible and life-changing for the helpers and the helpees. I feel blessed and privileged to be able to help people at their most vulnerable, watch them open themselves up and regain some power, knowledge and identity throughout the process. By far the experience has been a positive one. More than 80% of the cases I've worked on have had what I would call a positive outcome, where we identify a parent or close family and the response is positive. Of course, everyone is surprised and who would it be? But given time to process and to get to know each other, most people are fundamentally kind. Some of the connections have been incredible, inspiring and beautiful. Grown men find mature, intelligent adult children that they didn't know they had. 
Sometimes there is grief from both parties for time and opportunities lost, but this is to be expected and part of the process. The single biggest, the single biggest issue I hear from other donor-conceived adults in search of their biology is, how will this make my dad feel? We are still projecting and worrying about our dads, even as adults. Like our mothers did before us, we tried to blunt the edges for our infertile but loving fathers. My main message is to parents of donor-conceived children and to the industry as a whole is that there is actually no such thing as anonymity anymore. I do not object to donor conception, but I do object to anonymity. I should not have had to spend six months of my life searching for my donor, only to find them just in time to connect. How is this fair to me or to any of us? So please consider the best interests of the children in all cases, as they'll grow up to be opinionated, intelligent and strong-willed adults who will be able to find the answers they seek. But it's not something to be scared of, it's an opportunity. An opportunity to tell the truth to your children and to engage and support donor-conceived people and donors, and to revise and fine-tune legislation to make sure that later generations of donor-conceived people do not share my experience. I'm going to present two case studies now. I have permission to share the information that I'm going to share with you tonight. The first case study I would like to present is about Courtney and Keith. Courtney and I were born the same year through the same clinic, so we bonded on the pipe dream that we might be sisters. <laughs> Courtney has no records relating to her conception, Courtney's case was only the second case I worked on, but one of the most rewarding, partly because of the result, but also because of the friendship that developed during the process. Courtney had a lot of DNA matches in far north Queensland, so I needed to get up to speed with Queensland records and geography. After about six months, we'd worked out who we thought her donor was. And on that same day, a new match with a donor-conceived half-sibling turned up on one of her DNA websites. Funnily enough, we shared the same amount of <coughs> DNA with a half-sibling as we do with a grandchild. So Courtney was bluntly told by 23andMe that she had a granddaughter. <laughs> <laughs> Which is confronting a month before your 40th birthday. <laughs> this half sibling was able to introduce Courtney to her donor as her case had been a private donation arrangement. Courtney and Keith, her donor, hit it off. They've become great friends. And Keith's openness and warmth and welcome has been an inspiration to us all. He's the second grandpa to her little boys and she's a big sister to his teenage sons. I'm very happy to have helped bring these two together. The second case study is about Wendy and her donor, James. I started helping Wendy about three years ago. She was born in the 1990s in Queensland, and the clinics couldn't provide her with any information about her donor, or would not provide her with any information about her donor, or her donor conceived siblings. Wendy's DNA results showed a huge amount of Irish DNA, and Irish records are difficult in family history. Records are poor and do not go back far enough in time to build meaningful trees, and the repetition of common names makes research difficult. Thankfully, a second cousin came, on, came through on Ancestry, allowing us to confirm the donor's parents. <clears throat> we knew that her donor was one of three brothers, so Wendy bravely wrote a letter, polite and inoffensive, and sent it to these three men. One responded, he was a famous artist, and it had definitely not been him. Of his two brothers, one had cut off contact with the family, one had advanced early onset Alzheimer's. Wendy established a rapport with his potential uncle and he agreed to a private DNA test. He also put Wendy in touch with his brother's medical power of attorney to arrange a DNA test. The DNA test results came back and confirmed that Wendy's donor was James, the brother with advanced Alzheimer's. Wendy met him in his care home and told him he was her father. He couldn't talk or communicate anymore, but he cried when she told him. <coughs> so Wendy has been her own champion through this process. She's had no support from clinics or government or anyone else apart from our donor conceived network and her family and friends. She's now had more than eight donor conceived half siblings turn up on Ancestry.com and half of the people don't know they're donor conceived. This is a perfect example of how by accident and not of our choosing we become the gatekeepers of our parents' secrets. And this case highlights the need to me for donor linking legislation throughout Australia and counselling and support for donor conceived people in all states. We're all entitled to our medical history and the support we need to process this information. Thank you for coming along tonight. Thank you very much.